Well, I was very heartened, uh, Jordan, by your affirmation of the objectivity of moral values and duties. You said there are things that are unquestionably good and unquestionably evil, that these moral values are not things that are invented, but they are discovered. And I couldn't agree more. And I would want to push you on this to say that this very consideration ought to help you to move through naturalism and beyond naturalism to a transcendent ground for the objectivity of these moral values and duties. Because they won't be found in naturalism. Uh, the naturalist is trapped in the lower story. Uh, objective moral values and duties are not physical entities described by the laws of nature. These are transcendent realities, either platonic uh, or else grounded in God. Um, and therefore, the very affirmation of the objectivity of moral values and duties that was so strong throughout your talk, uh, which I so appreciate, it's, it's anti-relativistic, it's objectivistic. I want, to, I want to encourage you to push through that naturalism to finding a transcendent ground for these in theism. I think that's the most plausible moral theory that will enable us to affirm the objectivity of these moral values and duties. Yep. <clears throat> I've tried to work out the sorts of ideas that I portrayed in this talk today within a naturalistic framework as much as possible. Oh, for, for, because it, the naturalistic technique is so powerful, not, not least for that, but also because there's glimmerings in the scientific literature of the sorts of ideas that you portrayed when you mentioned that the evolutionary biologists are increasingly making the claim that morality is a biological adaptation. And I think you can make a very strong case for that, a much stronger case than has actually been made so far. Um, I think there is a, a, a very sophisticated ethic that has evolved that we recognize as a consequence of the evolution of our cognitive and emotional structures. I think that that recognition manifests itself in admiration. You know, people are very imitative. It's one of the things that characterizes us in contradistinction to animals who are not very imitative. It's probably the precondition for our linguistic capacity. One of the things that characterizes human existence is the capacity to spontaneously pick a model for emulation right, a model for admiration, and that's the manifestation of that moral instinct, to say, well, to admire is to want to copy. You say, well, what do you want to copy? Well, you want to copy that which is most admirable. What is most admirable? Well, what is most admirable, that starts to become a, that starts to become a transcendent question, right? You, you can imagine that the, the, the local examples of what's admirable, they're right in front of you, and and, and they're concrete and tangible, but to abstract out from that, that which is admirable in and of itself is simultaneously to construct something like the representation of a transcendent good. And that's, to some degree, how religious conceptions emerge from their underlying biological substrate. Now, you might say, well, that's merely reducing the religious conceptualization, the religious abstraction of what's good to the biological substrate. And I think you can read it that way, but I don't think that that necessarily indicates what it is. I think that the entire process of evolution is somehow shaping itself around maybe platonic ideas, something like that, some transcendent good. And that it's a mistake to assume that just because you can make an association between the transcendent abstract good and the process of evolution that one is necessarily reducible to another. It, it fact, isn't the way reality that works. To commit the genetic fallacy to try to say that because one's moral beliefs originated through such a, a biological evolutionary process that therefore they are explained away and have no objective validity. That, that just is to commit well, a I, genetic yeah, fallacy. Well, I think partly it? what happens too is that you, you, at that level of analysis, you have to start questioning 
your initial presumptions like the idea that the most true truth is objective because I'm not sure it is I don't think we understand what constitutes truth very well and there's the truth that you act out as well as the truth that tells you what the world is made of and those aren't necessarily the same thing and so things get very murky at that level of abstraction but one thing I have learned from attempting to reduce religious preconceptions to their biological substrate is that there's always something left over that you haven't explained and it's it's not something trivial because every time I look into what's left over it turns out to be unutterably deep and I get rid of some more of it and the rest becomes unutterably deep and so Dr. Goldstein. Yeah. Um, I believe just as strongly in uh, objective moral truths. And I do, in fact, um, I, I, I completely reject your argument uh, that it requires either a grounding in God um, or into, in some sort of platonic uh, ideals. Um, there, there is an ancient argument, it goes back to Plato, Plato's Euthyphro, uh, that of, uh, uh, tries to argue that, well, quite in my book, successfully argues that the addition of God really doesn't help with grounding morality. Um, and this is the, uh, Socrates asked uh, a priest, Euthyphro, of the ancient Athenian, religion, um, uh, tell me, what is it that makes something good? And, and Euthyphro answered uh, that, God, that God loves it. Uh, God, it's God's attitude, or the God's attitude, uh, that, that makes it good. And Socrates asks, um, well, does God love the good because it's good, or is his loving it what makes it good? Um, if it's the first, that God loves giving to the vulnerable, to the victims, to the orphan, to the widow, uh, because it's good, then there is something independent in virtue of which God loves these actions that makes them good, and that constitutes the reason uh, for the goodness. And if God hates genocide and loves uh, charity, uh, then there is a reason in virtue of which uh, God has these moral attitudes. And if God himself has no reason for it, if it's just whim, if it's caprice, then is that really satisfying our answer as to what makes good acts good and bad acts bad? That the addition of God doesn't ground things at all. It leaves, it, it, it makes what seems to us mysterious and answers it with another mystery. Um, so th this is, you know, an ancient argument repeated by Spinoza, repeated by, by, by Russell, repeated by people. Um, and, and I would like to ask you how you answer the question. And so, so I guess my question to you is, what do you say to the Euthyphro argument? How does God really help? I'm really surprised. <laughs> I'm really surprised to hear you trot out the old Euthyphro dilemma, because this has been answered over and over again by contemporary Christian philosophers like Robert Adams, William Alston, and others. The Euthyphro dilemma is a false dilemma. It posits two non-mutually exhaustive choices. Either the gods love something because it is good, or uh, uh, it is good and therefore they love it. The theistic alternative to the Euthyphro dilemma is that something um, is good because it is identical with God. God is the good. God is what Plato referred to as the good. Um, so that the 
the reason God wills something is because he is good. And his moral commands to us reflect the goodness of his own intrinsic moral nature. God is by nature essentially kind, loving, compassionate, fair, and so forth. And this completely resolves the Euthyphro dilemma because it's a third alternative uh, to the, uh, the question. A dialogue that you have with Jordan Peterson and Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein on the meaning of life, it's something that you're well known for. And so this was a real treat, I think, for you to be in front of such a large audience. Talk about the event. So by having the opportunity to appear on stage in a dialogue with Jordan Peterson, I had the opportunity of expressing a Christian perspective and a defense of the Christian view of meaning in life in a forum that would gain a great deal of attention. And in order to have more opposition among the participants, the organizers wanted to add Rebecca Goldstein because they knew she was a determined naturalist, whereas Jordan Peterson is more agnostic and indeed very open, almost a kind of seeker spiritually. And so they wanted to have someone who would be the counterpoint for me, and that was Rebecca Goldstein, actually, with Peterson in the middle. And so it turned into this three-way dialogue that I thought was very, very instructive. Peterson and Goldstein seem to both hold to objective moral values. Certainly, Peterson did. He yeah. was very clear mm -hmm. about that. He, he said that moral values are discovered and not created. Mm -hmm. So that was very encouraging, and I wanted to camp on that because in the dialogue I wanted to align myself with him as much as I could um, so as to try to draw him into the Christian orbit. And so that was a very important point of commonality. And aren't you glad, Bill, that your co-host here, Kevin Harris, has asked you so many times about the Euthyphro dilemma <laughs> because lo and behold, oh, it man. came up. I know. Rebecca brings it up. You know. I, I have had people who are reasonable faith listeners say that they, they just couldn't believe their ears when she trotted out the old Euthyphro dilemma as though this were something new and devastating. And it, it just shows the complete lack of engagement on the part of a very secular philosopher with Christian philosophy. The fact mm. is that a lot of these people just don't read us. They don't read Christian philosophers. They're ignorant of what it said. And so they rehearse these tired old objections over and over again. You know, I recently had a debate with Eric Wielenberg on the best account for objective moral values and duties. Wielenberg is an atheist. And he shared with me that one of the things that distinguishes his work is that he, unlike his colleagues, takes really seriously the work of Christian philosophers in this area, people like Robert Adams and William Alston and Steve Evans and uh, others. And according to Wielenberg, his secular colleagues just don't bother to read or interact with these Christian philosophers on these matters. And that was so well illustrated by Rebecca Goldstein's um, ignorance of the um, response to the Euthyphro Dilemma. Mm -hmm.